Hi everyone, Namaskar and welcome. Um, my name is Juan Sopan Panic and I'm the Global Cluster Coordinator for Camp Coordination and Camp Management. Um, the reason that I've been asked to join in to support on this session also because I was involved in planning of the Asia Shelter Forum in Bangkok um, two years ago. Um, <clears throat> so it's really good to be back and, and talking shelter again after some time. Um, so with me uh, is Mahul. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Mahul? Yeah, thank you so much, Ram. So this is Mehul. Uh, uh, I'm the technical advisor for Homes and Community based in Bangladesh from Catholic Relief Services. Um, the reason I have been here because I have been working in different uh, disasters and have been like supporting uh, a lot of the Asia Shelter Forum um, with my colleagues around there. So it has been great to have you all here. Thanks, Ram. Back to you. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> We have quite a packed agenda coming up, um, but before we start, um, let me go through the agenda briefly with you. We're gonna have um, an opening remark from Mr. Anil Pokhrel um, from NDRMA. And then we have four different presenters who's gonna be sharing with us the different work that they've been doing um, in trying to address the risk of multi-hazards, I think particularly um, in, in the region and the ranging from coastal to inland kind of context. Um, but right before we start, um, as per the last session in the main um, discussion, we would like to get to know you all a little bit more. Um, so if I can ask you to get out your phone again and, and go to menti.com, um, if you were paying attention in the last uh, discussion, um, you will, uh, um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen to do this. Oh, um, Mehul, uh, I'm not a host, so I can't share screen in here somehow. Ah, no, I can. All right, cool. So you can. So I can, yes, thank you. So if you please um, get your... Um, get your phone ready. And the number for this presentation is 3585963 and three. So the first question is partly like to ask where you're from and where you're working. Please note that um, I have harvested the, um, the names of countries from, from the chat, the earlier chat of people introducing themselves. Um, so apologies if your country is not there. Um, and obviously, as I'm hosting, I can't vote, but obviously I'm from Thailand. Um, and that, that's why Thailand is, is on the list, <laughs> despite no one introducing themselves as such. Um, one apologies, but, uh, could you please repeat the number of the code? Yes, it's 3585-9693. Three five eight five nine six three. Yes, perfect. Great. We just have a couple of questions just to allow us to get to know each other a little bit better. Mm -hmm. We did expect a lot of colleagues from Nepal joining us, so it's great to hear it. Um, if at any point I am speaking too fast, please let me know um, or any of the speakers <clears throat> um, and we'll do our best to try and be more clear in how we're speaking. Um, I see that now 18 people have joined. I'm glad to see those from the rest of the world. I'm actually currently sitting in Geneva, so I would also um, belong to that group. We're quite early. Okay, now 20 people. No problem if you're just joining. We're just um, doing a quick sort of um, get to know each other on Menti. You will see the number on the screen if you're just joining. I think we got about 60% um, of um, the people, which is not bad um, for Menti, getting higher all the time. Great. So, um, so for the next, how do I do this? Ah, okay. So, for next question, we would like to know a little bit about what's your role within the shelter sector. 
Um, are you working at the community level? Um, are you managing programs? Are you doing regional or HQ advisory? Are you with the government uh, or you are, are you providing technical expertise um, to, to the work of your organization or your department and institutions? It's always very good to have uh, to see that we have a range of people joining us, um, particularly also um, to see a number of government um, participants also. Though I think we're quite lucky because we have a few um, um, government uh, um, actors also joining us to share their experience in this work. I see a number of um, program managers. We have technical experts, great. Um, cool, perfect. I'm gonna move on to our last question. Oh, I see some of you still coming in. How does this, it doesn't let me do. Uh -huh. All right, so a quick question on who you think should be should be taking leadership in preparing and responding to multi hazard. If you choose others, please feel free to also put in the chat in the comment as to who you think the actors should be. Unfortunately, I think you can only select one. Um, this is a little bit of a trick question. Um, obviously, I think many of you would choose all if that's a possible uh, option. But it's great to see, yes, I mean, like local authorities, national governments and communities. I would like to see what the others are, though I'm currently unable to see the chat as I'm sharing my screen. Um, Cool, perfect. Thank you very much. I think it's really good to see um, the range of thinking around, around this. It will also be good to hear your thoughts whether, um, whether responding to multi-hazard sort of situation is different to just having a, a singular event, um, like the crisis event that takes place. Would it, take, um, would it be different on how we should prepare for it and how we will respond for it? Okay, and that is um, the end of the, the mentee uh, part of the discussion. So I'm going to turn over to Mr. Anil to, to do a welcome um, to, to our group here and, and to take our discussion forward. Thank you very much, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you so much. Uh, am I audible? Great. So... <clears throat> Distinguished guests, uh, facilitators, and all the participants across the globe, across multiple time zones, uh, namaste and good day. I'm really privileged to be part of this a breeze and virtual 2020 Asia CELTA forum for a meeting. Albeit this is this is my first one. Um, and countries in the Asia Pacific regions, including Nepal, are exposed to a multitude of hazards, with the most common being, as you know, recurrent floods landslides, typhoons, hurricanes, earthquake, forest fires, volcanic eruptions, and other, others affecting the lives and livelihoods of, and displacing millions of people every year. Monsoon floods and landslides, such as the one that we witnessed in Nepal this year, and lightning are very common in, in, in our countries. I would also not want to exclude earthquakes and other natural hazards that are a recurrent problem in this, in this part of the world. And, and we know that again, studies, multiple studies have predicted that climate change would further exacerbate the frequency and the intensity of hydrometeorological hazards um, in, in future. The nation has a primary obligation to reduce risk and to manage emergency response, including for reconstruction and recovery. But this is a shared responsibility, and we've seen it from, from the recent poll as well from the Menti. Um, and that it should be supported by other stakeholders, including the local governments, um, the private sector, the other stakeholders with accountability and responsibility. Now, learning from the 2015 earthquakes, the government of Nepal has made significant advances, especially in the field of reconstruction and recovery. And with the enactment of the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act in 2017, similar advancement on disaster risk reduction and management. There's been a 
a paradigm shift in the approach and investment from being a, a very much of a response centric to risk reduction and management in the context of, of Nepal and, and more so perhaps in other countries such as in, in Thailand, Philippines and other, other countries that we, we collectively work together. Now, I'm very happy to say that these efforts particularly and also in line are in line with the national commitment to the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction that has now been localized in the context of Nepal with the endorsement of the DRR strategic action plan uh, for a span of 2018 to 2030 and the national disaster risk reduction policy. So in line with the DRM act, the government of Nepal has established the NDMA and, the, and this authority that I had has a focus on disaster risk reduction and management. And we work in collaboration and coordination with the three tires of government including the humanitarian partners, children partners, donors, communities, and the private sector. As a CEO of this, this institution, I've been working on bringing all of the stakeholders for collective efforts to understand risk and to substantially reduce them in a multi-hazard context, such as in, in, in the case of Nepal. Now, <clears throat> everybody in this virtual meeting will, will agree with me that it is high time that governments need to think of preventing hazards and substantially reduce disaster risk through application of sustainable policies and strategies. This would contribute towards building resilience and substantial reduction of losses. Nepal's housing recovery policies in terms of reconstruction and retrofit retrofitting, land purchase, and support to the most vulnerable families, including other housing reconstruction policies, were able to really set standards for reconstruction stakeholders including for the housing beneficiaries, which led to the improvement in the efficiency and effectiveness of recovery process and recovery out outcomes. Over the last two days, we, we did really delve onto these, these issues as well. Um, so what we, what we reflect is there's a, quite a lot done in terms of improving these policies and guidelines, particularly for earthquake hazards, earthquake and, and for those earthquake uh, affected families in the response to the 2015 earthquakes in, in the Nepali context. Now, building on that, the NDRMA is currently working on devising a working procedure on reconstruction and recovery of these private housing, particularly targeting the poor families affected by other, other set of hazards such as floods and landslides. What we're doing is we're really bringing in the multi-hazard context into it, especially for lightning and, for, and floods and earthquakes in, in, this, in this Nepali context. And for this, we, we're really heavily drawing on, on the NRA's experiences to prepare this working procedure. Lessons from across the globe, uh, such as from Pakistan, from India, Bangladesh, have also been really helpful in terms of devising our, our working procedure. So <clears throat> enhancing disaster preparedness for effective res response and to build back better in recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction is one of the priorities of, of Sendai framework. The regional mechanisms such as this Asia Shelter Forum and other technical working groups under various thematic issues um, are platforms to foster a much coherent and, uh, and an all of our organization approach. Such forums certainly can improve our coordination among all shelter actors, thereby promoting better shelter practices, including through information sharing at all levels from national to regional level and ultimately contributing to the Global Center Forum. Once again, I'm really pleased to be part of today's important events. And I strongly believe that this sort of regional platforms where all concerned national and regional stakeholders and from multiple set of domains do come together and work in solidarity, share information, share lessons and expertise is an effective and an efficient way if not the only one in the region and perhaps globally to overcome challenges in efforts to reduce risk build resilience in a durable and a peaceful manner. Uh, I really look forward to the interesting session hereafter. Um, thanking you all once again for participating in this, uh, in this forum and particularly for this session. Uh, over to you, Juan. Thank you very much, Mr. Neil. Um, as we're, we don't have much time to go through, I'm going to start um, with our, um, so we have four presenters today um, who will be sharing their experience and, and the work that they're doing. <coughs> Apologies. Um, and we're gonna go from, you know, the assessment side of, 
of the discussion until the to the response and working with communities. So without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Renato Solidum from um, Philippines uh, Philvox um, to, to share the work he's doing, which he calls uh, the Hazard Hunter. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I was invited to talk about the Hazard Hunter Philippines an application out of a very big ICT initiative called Geo Risk Philippines Initiative. Essentially, the Hazard Hunter is a one-stop shop for hazards assessment. And essentially, if you look at the setting of the Philippines, it is exposed to many natural hazards, from frequent hydrometeorological hazards with the passage of tropical cyclones to instantaneous earthquake events, tsunamis, and even volcanic eruptions, with the background of the increasing temperature of around 0.1 degrees centigrade, which would exacerbate these various natural hazards. Realizing that there is a gap in hazards, risk, and data access and assessment, the country's technical staff from various organizations, led by my organization, Department of Science and Technology, agreed to standardize geospatial information and develop a database to facilitate efficient hazard and risk assessment. We have various organizations doing hazards mapping and risk assessment, but we need to make sure that this would be accessible to all. We have produced this Geo Risk Philippines initiative, which has a tagline, Innovation for Resilience. It has been funded by the Department of Science and Technology, where I am the Vice Minister or Undersecretary. It has two platforms. The first is the physical platform, which is tangible. It is a whole of government ICT system where tools are developed for data integration, management, analysis, and assessment of information. The second, which is intangible, would be the governance platform, where different stakeholders, government to government, government to citizens, government to businesses, can collaborate for the sharing, standardization, and optimum use of information necessary for risk valuations and consequently for good governance. Essentially, the GeoRisk Philippines integrated system consists of participating organizations which have their own databases, a platform, a server, data, database servers to integrate this data from various organizations and a data analysis platforms consisting of three major applications, Hazard Hunter Philippines, where I was requested to discuss, but there are two other important platforms, the GeoAnalytics platform and GeoMapper platform. Essentially, getting information is easy, but integrating this is difficult. So we have developed a 16-digit numeric code for any information to be provided in the database, and this code would allow you to update things very easily in the future by just focusing on the number that needs to be updated automatically. It will have the same geographic projection. We have data protocols and collaboration agreements. What are these different platforms under GeoRisk? The first is you need to input the exposure data, polygonize all the houses and buildings and whatever information you want to be included as your exposure database. This GeoMapper would have a web-based and digital, uh, digital tools where you can go to the field or do offline survey, surveys to really describe all the features on the surface. This is uh, for national and local governments to be used with credentials. The next application is the geoanalytics application. It is for visualization and analytics, where one can actually see immediately an evaluation of the land area, the population, the gender, the ages, and many others that are critical for planning at the local and national level. This is also publicly available. And lastly, the Hazard Hunter Philippines, which is a one-stop shop for hazard assessment, or essentially hazard assessment at your fingertips. This is for everyone. The hazard assessment uh, platform called the Hazards Hunter is a hazard awareness tool for everyone, individuals, families, and institutions for various purposes. Shown there would be the URL, hazardhunter.georisk.gov.ph, 
but uh, there is also a uh, an Android version or an app for this, but we will relaunch this uh, app again this December. What do you do for this Hazard Hunter Philippines? Hazard Hunter Philippines is the country's one-stop shop for hazard assessment. It is an online natural hazard consultant or hazard doctor. It's also on-the-go GIS specialist. It has the most reliable information for hazards and exposure, and it is free 24 hours by seven hazards assessment service. It is very easy to use. Once you are in the landing page of the platform, there are four options to take to begin hazard assessment. The first option is to type your location and click search. Second is to use your GPS. And if you're there in the particular area you're interested, you just use the click use current location. The option three is to use the technical coordinates, latitude or longitude. And the other option, which is most people do this, is to go to map view and zoom in to a particular location in an area of interest. Once you double tap the particular area of interest, you will get multi-hazard assessment in less than one minute. There is a summary table that you will be shown that is on the left screen. You can also see the distance of point to nearest critical facilities like hospitals, roads, schools, and whatever is available in the, the app. And more importantly, a hazard assessment summary report detailing all the hazards that has been assessed and also the recommendations and actions. Let me show this in more detail. This is an example hazard assessment of a place. Once you select that place and double tap it, on the right side of the screen, you will see seismic hazards assessment, volcanic hazards assessment, hydrometeorological assessment. It will tell you the distance to the nearest active fault and also the nearest active volcano. If the assessment is in red, then that area is prone to a particular hazard. If you want to know the very detailed report of the hazard and a recommendation, you type the view report with recommendation. That hazard assessment result would have the following. It will show you the government agency where the data has been gathered, a QR code. When used later on, it will, when you uh, scan it, it will give you the updated version of the assessment. It gives you the time, time, date, and location of the uh, coordinates for the assessment. So if the assessment changes in the future, then you will have another one. The hazards assessment type, the type of hazard, the hazard assessment result, explanations and recommendations, and many other things. The menu of these hazards apps can, can have various functions. You can choose the base map, a satellite map, an open street map, or other maps. More importantly, you can choose the hazards that you want to show. Seismic hazards, volcanic hazards, hydrometeorological hazards. If you want advanced type of hazards assessment like spectral acceleration map or probabilistic map for earthquake uh, uh, ground acceleration, you can have it also. Also for the probabilistic assessment for strong wind. Exposure information are also gathered. Uh, you can uh, uh, add more exposure information if uh, this would be shared by other organizations. Right now we have the public schools from elementary to high school, health facilities, both uh, government and private, road networks that are major to uh, uh, secondary and also the boundary. These are uh, to be added uh, with more information shared by other government organizations. For example, you want to know the tsunami proneness of an area. You just click on tsunami and the tsunami hazard will be color coded depending on the height. If you want to know the actual political boundaries in the area, you click on also the boundaries. If you want to know how many hospitals are there that are exposed to the hazard, you can also, it can also be shown. There are, all, there are also more advanced analytics in the hazard that I cannot really share because of lack of time, but uh, this can be explored very easily by just clicking all the buttons on the left side or on the right side. Legends are shown uh, on the right side and the particular data set that you can actually show. The last uh, feature that I wanted to explain would be if there is an ongoing flood or impacts, then you can also see it in the Hazard Hunter. For example, the recent Typhoon Bangkor Ulysses had a big flood event in Northern Philippines and from satellite image interpreted using artificial intelligence, we can actually put in the interpreted flood map and even overlay it to actual hazards maps for the area. 
people can also report disasters, post videos or pictures so that we can actually know what's going on in other areas of the Philippines. The Hazard Hunter can also alert you for an earthquake event that has happened. There are many other features that uh, one can see in the Hazard Hunter. So essentially everything can be done in a, in a, ver in a mobile version or a uh, computer version, all using your fingertips. If you want to know more about the GeoRIS Philippines, um, our website is georis.gov.ph. We have YouTube channels for, uh, for introduction and actual use, Facebook, and other um, questions can also be emailed using georis.gov.ph. This is not a one-off uh, project. This is to be hosted by the Philippine Institute of Oconology and Seismology with dedicated scientists. And by the way, we are a multi-hazards organization doing monitoring and warning, hazards and risk assessment, scientific research, and even awareness and preparedness campaign. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Renato, and for such an interesting and very um, pragmatic um, sharing of, of the tools. Um, I think Philippines, unfortunately, having faced so many of the different um, hazards and, and disaster risks. Um, <clears throat> it's really impressed to see, um, you know, the tools that the, the, the country is, is coming up with. And I was really struck by your comment on, you know, like getting data is easy, you know, but that it's like making use of it is, is the, the more challenging part. And I'm glad to hear about the app. And, and I think, you know, like making it usable for people who are also at risk of anything that might come their way as well. So thank you very much for that. And so I'm going to ask our next presenter to also jump in. And this is Gaurav uh, Tapa from People in Need in Nepal, who's going to share some of the work that they've been doing with the earthquake affected um, a, a population in Nepal as well. Over to you, Gaurav. Thank you, Juan. Um, let me just share my screen. Can you all can you all see my screen? Great, thanks. Um, uh, thanks to the facilitators for this opportunity uh, to take part in this uh, really interesting um, session. Um, so my name is Gaurav Papa. I'm project manager at People in Need, and. Um, so People in Need is a Czech-based humanitarian and development-focused INGO. Uh, we began providing relief and aid to Nepal in 2015, uh, after the country was hit by the most devastating um, earthquake in the last century. Uh, and immediately after the uh, disaster, uh, PIN provided emergency assistance to those in the most heavily impacted areas and for people who lost essentially everything. Um, so while the, the earthquake destroyed about 600,000 homes, damaged over 300,000, we really focused on those who were forced to leave their villages and live in IDP camps. And there we provided sort of temporary transitional shelter uh, solutions. And, and we've been supporting those communities uh, ever since. So uh, after that first um, phase of, of response, uh, we focused on a more HLP, or durable solutions approach, and that's what I'm going to. Sorry, Garaf, are you meant to be t um, going to the next slide, or no, no, <laughs> this ah, is okay, an introduction. <laughs> or you want to do it to the yeah present attention mode? Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, so yeah. So we uh, started our more uh, durable solutions approach, um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So durable solutions is a UK aid funded program. Uh, we started this uh, second phase in early 2018, uh, and we plan to wrap up in the next couple of months. Uh, but the core of the program is to facilitate the National Reconstruction Authority uh, of Nepal with their resettlement program. So um, their resettlement program provides eligible households with 200,000 rupees uh, to help buy safe land, safe from geohazards, um, and then about 300,000 rupees to rebuild their homes uh, compliantly. So our objective is to support this program. And we can essentially um, break down the DS2 program into four components. The first is implementation and coordination. 
which is to facilitate safe relocation of eligible households uh, to access government grants and purchase uh, new safe land. So this included um, you know, our field teams going out into the earthquake affected areas, uh, supporting identification of beneficiaries, uh, orienting communities on the availability of grants and the process to access them, uh, as well as a more practical support, which was um, to actually support households to uh, compile the critical documents they needed to access these grants, uh, to actually uh, help them go through the bureaucratic process from ward level to um, the land survey department to municipality uh, in order to access um, these government grants. Um, and the second part uh, was geohazard assessment. So in tandem to facilitating um, relocation, we also supported the National Reconstruction Authority with uh, technical staff, which is a, a team of geologists whose job was to go out uh, to sites that were flagged by communities uh, and by local government and to survey them for actual or potential geohazards. In that way, uh, we were able to tell whether communities could start rebuilding in their place of origin or they need to be relocated. Um, third, uh, we provided policy development support um, with our consortium partner, TSRC. We helped draft the relocation and resettlement policy. And in particular, we tried to include um, landless households, households that do not possess land under, under their name and are unable to manage uh, or to buy land um, with their income. Uh, there were thousands of these households uh, and they were affected by the earthquake as well as by geohazards. So we tried to integrate them into the relocation and resettlement policy. Uh, finally, uh, we focus on building resilience. Uh, we, um, we found very early on in the relocation process that while communities were able to shift to new safe lands, uh, subsequent haphazard and unplanned rebuilding uh, led to risks. So lack of drainage, retention walls, drinking water sources, all of these things were creating risk. Uh, so we addressed or tried to address those problems as well. So um, we supported about 1,053 um, geohazard assessments across the NRA's working uh, area. Um, this was, uh, th these sites were categorized um, uh, according to global sort of durable solutions uh, programming. So for example, uh, 419 sites were category one. Uh, this means that these uh, communities were not at imminent risk of geohazards and they could begin reconstruction in their place of origin where they were staying um, prior to the disaster. Um, 320 sites were categorized as CAT2. Uh, these sites were unsafe due to existing geohazards, but those geohazards could be mitigated through engineering work. And only after those work uh, were, were completed, uh, communities could start rebuilding in those places. Uh, and third, about 314 sites were categorized as CAT3. Uh, this means that these sites were unsafe due to geohazards and um, could not be mitigated uh, through any um, means. Uh, and these are the communities that we focused on. Uh, these uh, were the communities that needed to be relocated to uh, new lands. Um, so just I'm gonna go through our achievements really quickly. As I said, we um, surveyed about 1,053 sites uh, and we focused on the category three sites, um, uh, which really totaled to about 4,124 households that needed to be relocated. And over the past two years, we, uh, we have completed um, facilitation support for about 2,570 households. Uh, they have been relocated uh, in the sense that they have uh, purchased new land uh, and uh, uh, have, have ownership in, in safe areas. Um, I mentioned landless households before. We uh, directly identified about 12,800 uh, landless households, uh, out of which 700 households uh, were, were relocated. Um, and through our sort of policy uh, development support or advocacy and facilitation support, we also um, support 10,938 households 
to stay in their existing place. So where they had been staying for generations, um, but they finally had legal rights to the land. And that meant that they were able to access um, reconstruction grants to start rebuilding their homes. Um, we also uh, supported um, about 20 sites with technical assistance. So this was part of our building resilience component. Uh, and we, uh, we helped 16 uh, relocated sites uh, to, to make uh, site plans uh, and uh, detailed project reports um, to um, sort of plan out the public infrastructure uh, that was needed to make their communities more resilient. So like I said before, uh, drainage, uh, trails, drinking water systems, uh, all of these were, um, uh, were fundamental to building the resilience of these relocated communities. Uh, and furthermore, we, we led about 185 uh, community-driven social protection programs. So we focused on uh, women um, and we uh, gave out uh, mini grants for them to invest in their own safety. So for example, they uh, were used in um, public bathing stations, uh, street lights, just to enhance their safety in their newly relocated um, communities. So a bit durable solutions was a, was a two million pound program, but over the course of two years and through these facilitation supports, we unlocked about 31 um, million pounds um, worth of NRA grants that went directly to the beneficiaries. And so that really speaks um, to the, the effectiveness of facilitation support immediately after, after disasters and to be able to access those government grants that are out there. Um, we've developed a website kind of dashboard that tracks um, uh, communities, uh, whether they have left their place of origin, where they've moved to, uh, displacement camps, and finally where they ended up uh, relocating to, um, and as well as the various integrated settlements that are being developed throughout the, the NRA's working areas. So you can find that information in our website. Um, and that's it from me. Um, looking forward to answering your questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Gaurav. And um, I do encourage people to, to ask questions in the chat. We are, um, as we're a little bit late, so we'll be pushed for time. So please do, and panelists, please do feel free to answer them directly in the chat. It's really interesting to see the different types of like scale of assessments to, you know, like geohazard assessment that then goes towards ensuring durable solution for people who've been impacted by the earthquake. So moving swiftly on, um, <clears throat> I'm going to try my best to pronounce your name. I would like to invite uh, Meshba Udin Ahmed from Caritas Bangladesh um, to also share some of the work on resilience and climate smart shelter design. Um, so please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Juan. Let me, okay. Respective participant and moderator, good afternoon. This is Mezbauddin Ahmed from Karitaj, Bangladesh. Today I am going to present Karitaj, Bangladesh last 50 years learning on shelter and settlement response. Since 1970, Karitaj, Bangladesh uh, shelter construction integrated into his post-disaster response. In this regard, Karitaj, Bangladesh implemented a project to understand the local context and the uh, local techniques uh, for that, Kaitaj Bangladesh constructed 110 low-cost house housing to learn from the local community through the uh, community engagement process. Uh, as you know, Kar Bangladesh already uh, 149 disaster faced from since 1970. The, uh, the cyclone, flood, seismic, and landslide are the common disaster for Bangladesh. In the project, uh, first we evaluated the local context, and after that we piloted the design and technical solution with the community engagement. From that design and technical solution, the process, tools, and the learning we disseminated to local, national, and international communities and stakeholders to adopt that learning and to uh, and for the. Uh, new uh, and for the for the solution 
uh, adaptation was uh, several NGOs and humanitarian actors are adapted in Bangladesh. After that, that, uh, that learning, we undertook a study is, we are calling is uh, capitalization. Shelter, we, 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 it's not a shelter, we considering it's a homes. So that we, uh, we consider all aspects of the community, like environment, lakes, natural hazard, climates, to ensure the social cohesiveness of the community. From data collection to the final result, several states we engage uh, community to validate and uh, taking their feedback to adjust that design. As a community engagement, community meeting, technical meeting, technical notes, observation to learn the community technique and community mapping to identify the risks of community we conducted. As a result, you know, the northern part of Bangladesh is a flat prone area. For the northern part of Bangladesh people, the quick disassemble structure was appropriate to shift their structure material from flood area to safe place. Western part is an extremely heated area in Bangladesh. So the think wall, think muddy wall was appropriate for that area to reduce the heat into the house. Chirang hilly area. Chirang hilly area, basically the landslide area and landslide hazards every year's years occurring. And different ethnic community of Bangladesh, they are situated in the hill, hilly areas. So ethnic communities, they are preferable to live in high areas. So the structure loading capacity is the main concern for the hilly areas. Eastern part, Eastern part basically mountain flooded area. So in that area, stone are available. So they are using the Eastern high plinth for the for uh, for protecting the flood, the learning and new initiative. Thirty-five low-cost housing model prepared, and these model are five hazard specific. Community lead selection process to appropriate response on emergencies. As a technical solution, strong resilience design, safe accessibility, environment friendly local material, private privacy and gender sensitivity and sustainability was the main learning from that study. To capitalize the study, further uh, Karitaj Bangladesh constructed around 326 disaster shelter within, within several places of Bangladesh. And also 4,000 resilient shelters have been in 50 districts in Bangladesh. That learning we also incorporated to Rohingya crisis. In the Rohingya crisis, 6,000 households already received the shelter assistance and also 4,000 emergency shelter we constructed. Now we are the co-lead on the shelter sector of Cox's Brother. Recent COVID pandemic, around 6,500 households received emergency assistance from Karitaj, Bangladesh. Thank you, that's all. If you have any question, you can ask. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm hoping that I think if we're going the rate we're going, we will have some time for um, a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Um, so lastly, we have, um, <clears throat> we have colleagues from Karuna Myanmar Social Solidarity um, who will be sharing with us about community-led and holistic approach to shelter, camp closure, as well as return and resettlement program. Um, so perhaps if I can, Meshba, if I can, um, if you can stop sharing screen, so I will, um, I will share it for K KMSS as well. Um, Meshba, can you please um, stop sharing screen? Yeah, sure. Thank you.
sorry, it's, it doesn't allow me to override you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Is this okay now? <clears throat> yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, so let me do that again. Um, wait a moment. So just give me a second. I'm not sure why it's not coming up. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. So um, please go ahead. I'm just going to work to put your slide on more properly. There you go. So, uh, thank Michael? you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, allow me to present KMS's presentation on the project about the community-led uh, construction. This is the project about uh, community-led uh, construction. Uh, it linked to Juniper Solution, uh, focused in northern part of Myanmar. Uh, it is the pilot project, which is conducted by jointly with uh, CRS and KMS. This is learning by doing project, evidence-based learning and documentation. Allow me to brief about the history of uh, the context in Myanmar, uh, especially uh, in Kachin State. Uh, starting from 2011, uh, conflict started again in Kachin State, where people are going to different places, like government control area and non-government control area. Um, starting from 2015, uh, people from IDP camp, they are willing to go back to their place of origin. By listening to the voice of the people, uh, accompanying the people, uh, listening to the voice of the people, receiving the request letter from the IDP, while well, we facilitate return process in 2015. Now, starting from 2018, uh, the government coming up a kind of camp closure strategy as well as the, all religious leaders and um, non-government control area uh, KIO and the government are now in the same page to do facility return in Kitchen State. Uh, that is why this is the project that community-based construction is so important from for the community. Uh, like in here in Kitchen State, uh, we have 167 ITB camp uh, that are located in government control area and non-government control area. Uh, in government control area, all ITB are located in church compound. Uh, in non-government control area, all camp are managed by IRRC. Uh, can we go the second, second uh, third slide? Yeah, uh, actually why they want to go back to the uh, place of origin or relocation site, actually uh, like camping in the camp is like they have been staying in the camp like five years, six years now, almost 10 years. So the housing is the barrack housing the camp environment that have a lot of issues like related to well-being, dignity, health, and moral issue. Uh, perception of the IDP population are now linked to dependency. So especially the obstacle of the issue of land issue, land my issue, or like business grabbing the land, these kind of things are happening to their respective villages. That is why the IDP cannot bear anymore. They look for the brighter future. That is why by listening and receiving the request letter from the community, we started a pilot project like community-based construction, community-led shared, uh, shared uh, construction happened in uh, Kachin State. Like in the community-led approach, we call it a company man, like we used to call 
accompaniment in physical, accompaniment in psychosocial, accompaniment in spirituality. Here you will see integrated human development structure. That is what we call accompaniment. So that is why as a holistic approach, we accompany with the people where there is in the IDB camp or in the resettlement area in the place of origin. That is happening in Pichin State. You will see in the map, there is the pilot location in Pichin State. Actually, Pichin State is close to the China border area. When we started the community-led uh, approach, you will see the frame there. Can, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, here we have uh, three options, community-led framework. One is community group with community land. Actually, the land that is bought by the IDP themselves, they collected the money and they initiated and they bought the land by themselves. And second thing is actually when they have the land, they do not know what to do. That is why, uh, uh, technicians and uh, like with the help of CRS, uh, we facilitate the community part. Uh, second thing is hybrid part solution where a group want to return and integrate it into an existing villages, but have individual pilot, but no share yet as an owner. That is why we divided as a hybrid part uh, of as an option too. Like the third one is individual households are returning, uh, integrating with family members or to their original land. By having this kind of option one, two, three, we also consider as uh, environmental dimension, social dimension, uh, economic dimension. So explaining the uh, environmental dimension, we have land, parcel and infrastructure. As a social part, uh, community like the government engagement, religious engagement, the village administration and enga engagement are really important. Like the financial, actually when we started the community-based construction, construction, like cat-based initiation is as a group, they formed the committee, they managed the community, based construction managed by the people themselves. And we go the last one, please. Yeah, actually as a pilot project, uh, we reflected that uh, humanitarian sector and development sector are a little bit different. Here, when we conduct as a humanitarian sector, we mostly we work with the contractor uh, in like building the camp, building shelter in the camp. But when we go back to the place of origin, uh, people uh, wanted to change another design. That is why the people then they themselves decide to make, to manage their house as a community led approach. That is what we see. That is why they take ownership. They look for sustainability. Uh, that is why local reintegration, uh, they are really satisfied what they have done as a pilot project in Chin State. Like community support are really important, like from camp setting to self-reliance, uh, a kind of uh, changing like delivery center to development center are really a important uh, for the community. Actually, at the beginning, forming of the committee is so important. So as a committee, they have role and responsibility. Uh, they take ownership. They lead this kind of community-led shelter construction as a pilot project in Bamo, in Kachin State. As a lesson learned, actually, livelihood activity is one of the key challenge, um, but we need strong coordination with the government, religious leaders, and all the things that is needed uh, 
for from the beginning of the project yeah that is why as a community led community based construction are really take ownership of the displaced people in Kachin state this is a very a successful pilot project happened in Kachin state uh, that is why we would like to share this uh, community led and construction are happening in Kachin State, especially happening in the return area in Kachin State. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Father Michael. Um, that was really great to see. And, <clears throat> and I think it's interesting to see the, the holistic approach to not just to the range of activities that that is um, used, but also the range of people who need to be involved in the planning process from the start. So we have just 10 minutes left of this session and I'm gonna hand over to my colleague Mehu to, to take us through the next part. Thank you so much, Ram. Um, uh, we had some very great presentations and, and we had been learning from the assessment now. So I would actually invite um, uh, Anil sir, uh, just to give the last words and uh, from what we have seen with the four presentations. Over to you, Anil sir. Mr. Anil? Uh, Mr. Anil, uh, we just was uh, trying to look at the last words, uh, but maybe I think uh, there's some tech issue. So maybe I can just... Uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah. Uttam, can you see the connection? No, okay. Hello. Yeah. Uh, may I request Mr. Anil, sir, uh, just if you have some last words. Okay. Uh, so it looks like there's some technical glitch with the connection. Uh, maybe I can just open up a, a question to all the panelists, maybe uh, just like one or two words, like basically like given that with all the all the climate change and the disasters happening, how do we think like in terms of um, of Asia, like how we should be adapting to the emergencies and coping strategies uh, and kind of like look more from the local government lens and the, and the communities that were kind of identified in the survey. So just like a couple of words from the panelists. So all the presenters, if you if you have any thoughts on that, if you want to unmute, please unmute and share. May I request uh, Mr. Goro, if you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, hi, thank you, Mel. Um, yeah. yeah, certainly, uh, that is actually um, one of the biggest challenges we're facing right now as Nepal has undergone very recently, um, this uh, decentralization uh, into a, fe a federal structure. So we have um, local governments now uh, mostly in charge of reacting to um, disasters. Uh, I think for us at this stage, I think it's still important to have a centralized um, support for local, um, local governments, uh, particularly when it comes to um, technical staff uh, with regard to um, assessing geohazards um, and then um, have making more sort of um, planned uh, or informed planning uh, when it comes to um, yeah both geohazards but also infrastructure and so on. So I think we still need um, some support from the central level uh, to local governments um, at this stage. Yeah, thanks, Garo. You you brought a very good point of like still having the support and building the capacity. Uh, Maybe I request, yeah, 
Please. Okay. Uh, let's run, actually, yeah. I'm Renato Solidum from the Philippines. Um, the centralization of response preparedness at the local level is good, but we need to make sure that this uh, decentralization has the accompanying capacity building for the local government, as already pointed out. But the real problem is we need to look at the scale of the hazards or scale of the possible disasters that can happen. Large-scale earthquake, tsunamis, of course, climate change is global, it's really, really very large. We must have, of course, localized operations, but are coordinated at the national level for large-scale disasters. Because uh, if you're the local leader, you're very concerned much about your political boundary. But for large-scale earthquake events, it should be at least at the regional to national level. And that is what we're trying to do. We prepare for large-scale disasters, both nationally and locally. That should be the strategy. You're uh, muted, Demil. Uh, thank you. And any other thoughts from Mr. Mesba or? Yeah, yeah, rightly, uh, localization is very important to effective response. In terms of shelter, you know, the local technique and the local uh, material to adopt the uh, humanitarian agencies and the other actor who are basically involved in the response in uh, shelter uh, in disaster time. So it should be considered because, you know, uh, with the, uh, the shelter material and the technique, if it is not acceptable by the community and the local administration and as well as the local stakeholder, it's difficult. <coughs> that experience we are facing in Bangladesh, you know, in Bangladesh is a multi-hazard uh, scenario country. In different parts, different hazard is every year occurring. So for that, it's uh, great for the Bangladesh if the uh, appropriate coordinated design for the every is a specific hazard specific design, if we can coordinate to all agencies as well as the, uh, the government of Bangladesh, that could be help to minimize the damage in the hazard period or disaster period. Thank you. Thank you so much. So just because of the time limitation, I might request uh, Van, uh, if you could just uh, like take over back again, Van, over to you. Thank you so much to all the panelists, yeah. Sure, um, sorry, I didn't realize that uh, <laughs> that went. I think everyone was very succinct, but um, I just want to thank everyone so much for, I think both participants, but also our panelists, I see a lot of different connections being made in the chat as well. Um, and I think that's something that we, is really good to see during these kind of forum and, and engagement. So even if it's online, but to be able to engage with each other, learn from each other. And I hope that this is not the end of your connection and engagement. I think there's more that we can continue to learn from each other as, as we go. I, <clears throat> I thought that the, um, the, the wrap up um, just now on from the panelists was, was really interesting to hear how a lot of the conversations come back down to, you know, like having appropriate, adapted, localized approach to the design, not just for the response, but also through the preparedness and into transition to durable solution. Um, and I think that is something that we take very much to heart as well. I, I think I speak for everyone on, on this aspect. Um, so a final thank you to all the presenters and for participants and for your engagement in asking different questions and, and to, um, just be actively um, present and engaging with our session today. I see that um, Utam has posted instruction and direction on how you can get back to the main session of the Asia Shelter Forum. So we'll be seeing you there in just a minute. Thank you so much again. Thank you.